join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Um, adjustments to the agenda, Alan. Yes, I have a few adjustments that are coming up recently. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is I will show you. You remember the last board meeting? You asked me to approve uh, whatever Gretchen was going to do at her next uh, field trip, and so that has come in. So I just have approved it, but just brought a copy to go over with you tonight. Uh, you also have a letter from Allie Gweither, which I mentioned to you in your school board update. I'll give these to you as, as they come up on the agenda. Uh, two resignations both came in today. So I will go over those two resignations with you. Um, I have some co-curricular additions, and I do want to talk about the interviews for the Administrative Assistant for the Superintendent and set up some schedules for those. So what we will do is, is Gretchen McNulty will be 6E on your agenda. Allie Weicker will be 6F. Retirements and resignations will be 6G. And 6H will be administrative assistant to the superintendent just to talk about the inter interviews. And under 11, 11A, where it's the co-curricular uh, fee positions. I'm going to add two there. One is for Pond Cove SST, and the other one is for Pond Cove Grade 1 Team Leader. As I said, I'll have paperwork for each of those as they come through. Uh, my other question to you is, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, what, what is that under E? 11E. Okay. E. Under 11 also, uh, we need to add 11E. Is this E? Yes. Which is the uh, contract for the uh, food service people that you've just gone over. So we'll also do that. Yeah, I thought so. It is. I thought I remember seeing that. Oh. We have 60, 11D. Yes. Sorry. Okay. I don't have it on mine, so. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. It was added Friday, so it okay. be that yeah, I have the, the earlier, uh, the earlier, Revision of the year, copy of it, have that on it. Okay. And then the only other thing that I will mention, if you go back up to 6B, you see information from Maine School Management Association on consolidation. I put in three sheets into your packet. We'll discuss those this evening. Uh, one of them you may want to take some action on. So at that point, we will have to move that down to probably then 11B which will be the main school management. So we'll talk about that when we get to it and uh, make some decisions on how you want to deal with that. I hope that's the only changes that I have on here. As far as I know. OK, great. Um, approval of October school board minutes. I move that we approve the school board um, minutes from the October meeting as presented. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any discussion? Arrows emissions? All in favor? Six to zero. Um, comments by student representatives. Um, we're missing uh, Hudson. Yeah, Hudson. Hudson could not be here today, right? um, would, you, would Kristen like to say something? Yeah, um, we had a good end of the first semester, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I think, Trish, we had some discussion maybe about um, having um, our high school representatives join some of our committees and I know I think maybe you've been asked in the past and maybe we can have a meeting um, I was interested in the policy committee okay Yay. and that's Thursday, <laughs> Thursday at noon. Yeah. yes and then I think Hudson was interested in extracurricular okay but I don't know when that is or if he can make that <laughs> well first Tuesday of the month first Tuesday of the month all right and, and you talked to Mr. Shadow about covering it so you can leave. Yeah. And nurses in the city. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to talk to them. I'll okay. see what class that'll be. Okay. And then I'll okay, very good. Great. So maybe we can just um, have them join those two committees. Is that all right with the board members? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. 
We'll move that forward then. And then we have our middle school representatives, Piper Otterbein and Michaela Ford. Would you like to come up? Hi. Um, the seventh and eighth grade dance was Thursday, October 25th, and teachers and chaperones thought that there was outstanding behavior. The middle school fall production, 100 Lies, performed November 8th through the 11th. We just finished off school conferences, and there are 552 conferences, and 70% of those involve student, students. There's no school Thanksgiving week, which is next week, but November 19th and 20th are teacher workshop days. This Thursday, 7th and 8th grade laptops are being turned in because they're not allowed home uh, during vacation. The middle school is hoping to start up a chess club. 7th, 7th graders attended Kiev the week of the 15th to the 19th, and more than 65% of 7th graders like Kiev more than Chuanki. Mm. Most students enjoyed the ropes course and evening activities, such as making up skits and air guitar. And that's it. Any Great. questions? Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. There is a change in student council, so now anyone can join this eliminated competition. And the meetings are every Thursday morning at 7. And the student council is also holding a food drive called Stuff the Bus. You fill the box in, in each homeroom with non-perishable items. There's a winner in every grade and they will be rewarded with a pizza or ice cream party. Um, and report cards are being changed electronically. And the trimester ends November 30th. And if you wish to not have your report card electronically, you should contact the school. And there is a ping pong club. And 18 people have joined. And there's lots more on the waiting list. And the civil rights group is still looking for more people to join. And the Civil Rights is a group so that everyone can feel welcome, and that's all. Thank you, Piper. Yeah. Great. Um, next is comments from public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone here to comment on non-agenda items? I seeing none. We'll move on. Uh, communications. Um, Alan. Okay. First one I have is set agenda for the <coughs> workshop meeting. What I, what I just wanted to go over with you is for that night, which is November 27th, I believe it is. Uh, what we will do is uh, do a final review of the December 1st report so that I can get that ready to send off to the commissioner uh, for December 1st. Or I probably will drive to the commissioner's office to take it out on December 1st. Uh, the second piece is to review the green sheets. And I believe it's, I've forgotten colors, but I think it's the green sheets and the yellow sheets. Uh, which are the green sheets out of the wish list, and the yellow sheets were the ones with questions uh, that some of you needed, wanted to have answered. So we'll also do that. And then we'll also do some discussion about budget, because by the time we meet that, uh, have that meeting, uh, it will be less than a month before the principals have to have their budget proposals into me and before I start reviewing them. So that is my plan for that night, and I just wanted to go over it with you quickly. And, uh, to make sure that I have covered all of the pieces to the puzzle that you feel need to be done that evening. Anyone adding anything? No questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Um, <coughs> 6B, information. Number two is information from, uh, this could be Main School Management Association on consolidation. There's a three-page uh, set of papers that you have in front of you. It starts out, it says at the top, Main School, Main School <coughs> Superintendents <coughs> Association. Okay. Uh, this came from Maine School Management. The original document uh, for this first page only was put together by the Maine School, uh, Maine School Boards Association. And what it is is basically when they met uh, two weeks ago uh, with their delegation, what they did was put this proposal together. It has since been reworded to say Maine School Superintendents Association. Uh, I attended the executive committee meeting of the main school superintendents the other day. Uh, what it is is basically is a plea to the commissioner and to the legislature to slow things down just a little bit. Uh, things are moving a little too fast. And so, for instance, what you will see on the second set of numbered pieces is number one, to give until July 1st, 2010, for an approved uh, regional school unit, RSU, to, be, to commence operation. Discussions that I heard at the executive committee was 
that many systems that are bringing in more than one town or several towns are still struggling. Many of them still have not found solutions to their problems yet. Um, some, of, some of them in Arista County and Washington County are also in the, uh, in the situation of, even if, though they're bringing home together five or six towns, they still can't get 1,200 kids in their population. So the request was the possibility of moving those numbers to a smaller number than 1,200. And it was made clear by the commissioner that that is not in the works, that the governor is against that. So there are a lot of issues. There are also a lot of funding issues when you're combining towns where you have one large town and several small towns that they are seeing as they do the funding issues that the larger town will take up even more debt with that. And so there are a lot of those issues. So the main school boards association was the first to look at it and say, please, let us slow down and have a chance to get this done appropriately. What they asked us to do is to bring these back to our boards so that you can review them. Uh, what they have also asked is if you find that this document fits into the picture that you want to see, then you can vote to let the main school, uh, main school management association know that you're in favor of it. You can decide not to do anything about it, or you could decide to vote against it. What I've also added to this is at the main school management association meeting, there was a superintendent there from Arista County. Uh, he is one of several who is leading a fight to have the entire uh, referendum abolished at this point in time. So what you see is the next two pages. These do not ask for any vote, or, but just so, so you know it, that the first one is a resolution to reverse the mandate, and the second one is the special resolution to repeal school consolidation law. Uh, my understanding of several weeks ago is these would not go before the legislature. However, there is a stronger push to have these go before the legislature. When you voted last Tuesday, there probably were people there getting signatures to try to uh, push this in front of the legislature to think about the possibilities of taking away the entire uh, law. So what you have then is really two different documents. The first one, based on Maine School Board Association, is a request to slow the process down. The s number two and number three are the documents that go with the possibilities of not supporting and uh, getting rid of the legislation as it stands now. Discussions that I heard the other day, obviously, I, try, I stay out of those discussions quite a bit because I am in a very different position than most of these districts are. But I certainly listen to a lot of the districts who are running into some serious problems as far as combinations. Uh, some of them are saying, yes, we'd like to have the law re repeal. Others are saying, I think in the long run it will work well for us, but we just got to have a little bit more time to do it. And then, of course, there are five of, of us who are high-performing districts who are all standing on our own now. Uh, I understand Yarmouth was the last of the five that was making the final decision. And so, obviously, we stand at a very different crossroad than the rest of them do. So I bring these back to you. I had them go in the packet so you'd have a quick chance to at least look them over. You do, there is no need of any vote tonight. It is just to see if you have any thoughts or discussion, or if you want to ask for a vote, then to request a vote under uh, the new business. And I'll stop talking now, so if you have any questions that I hope I can answer. Thank you, Alan. Um, overview of meeting with the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Chamber. Yes. Um, was that last Thursday? Yes, last Thursday. Uh, Jeff Shad, uh, Gail Schmader, and I were invited to talk with the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Chamber. Uh, I had never met with them before. I don't think Jeff had. I don't think Gail had. They have been, been very active in this area, and particularly at South Portland. But I've been very concerned all along that we have not had a voice with them to look at business connections with Cape Elizabeth. So we went uh, last Thursday, we had a dinner meeting with them, and as we ate dinner, uh, discussed some of the things that we are looking at and are doing, and some of the things we would like to do. In your packet, you have a two-page summary that Gail prepared. The first page is a sampling of business connections that we already have in the Cape Elizabeth school system. These are samplings, they're not complete. And the second page is business opportunities in the Cape Elizabeth school system, what we have or what we would like to have, 
and what we would uh, like to suggest. The third question that we asked them was, what can we do for them? And they really didn't do, uh, spend a lot of time answering that at this point. Uh, Jeff talked about the high school and the programs he has there. Uh, Gail did this piece. And then I was really uh, asked about what is going on in Cape Elizabeth right now. What are you doing for consolidation? What are you doing for putting uh, information together, et cetera? And so it was a very good meeting. Uh, there were probably 20, 20 people there with us and uh, had some interesting uh, comments and information. I think one of the things that I was most pleased with is one of the businessmen said to me, I've heard and read in the newspaper a lot about this being a uh, financial savings. I haven't read much about uh, what it does for students. And he said, can you tell me, based on the legislation, what it does for students? And I honestly had to say, no, I can't, because I haven't heard it either. And so I thought that was a very interesting comment, a very interesting insight on this situation. But they are, are meeting. They will be talking about some of the needs that Cape Elizabeth has. Uh, I think in the past, Cape Elizabeth has uh, kind of avoided them because we don't have the actual physical businesses in town. But what we do need to remember that many of the people who run those businesses live in Cape Elizabeth. And they were very interested in hearing about what we do. They're also very curious about when we talked about high performing, financially stable system. What's that mean? And what does it mean when they call you a financially stable system? So I spent quite a while uh, discussing that at the same time. So it was a good meeting and I do think Jane, thank Jane Eberly for setting it up for us and she said we will be invited back again to take a further look at this. Thank you, Alan. Um, D is a thank you note from Sue Welch, and if you, I know it's in your packets, but if you'd just let me read it to the public, because I thought it was awfully nice. It says, Dear Superintendent Hawkins, please extend to the Cape Elizabeth School Board my very heartfelt appreciation for the lovely painting done by local artist Rose Keneally, which was presented to me on the occasion of my retirement in June. It is rather amazing how well it titled Flower Fields fits the country home decor of my bedroom. I enjoy treasured family oak antiques in that room and with a quilt made by my grandmother from cotton, which she saved from grain sacks used in the Welch family farm. With my suspicion that the picture depicts, depicts the flower gardens and fields at Maxwell's as it existed until recently on Spurwink Avenue, it is a perfect match. For me, the painting celebrates a wonderful blend of my heritage, my extensive employment in and love of the Cape Elizabeth community, and my ongoing enjoyment of my home and retirement life. With lots of fond memories all around, I shall be ever grateful for this tangible reminder. Sincerely, Susan Welch. Alan. Yes, the next one is Gretchen McNulty. I'm going to pass this on to you. Uh, as I said, you remember at the last meeting, you gave me the go ahead to, to take care of the first trip that she wanted to do. Uh, this is the first trip. It is to the Princeton Model United Nations Conference. Uh, the schedule is attached. Uh, I went over it very carefully and I've talked to Gretchen. She's been very careful to manage to get everything in here, including uh, airport plans, uh, plans within the uh, city itself. She also has the uh, list of rules and regulations and expectations for students. She also included the parent-student consent consent paper, and she also included the code of conduct. Um, I went over it carefully. I uh, compared it with the um, policy. It seemed to fit every piece of the policy, and so I have told her that she had she may continue to plan on attending this one, and that I would sh just share this with you tonight. And also, if you do have any questions. Okay. Yep. Okay, number two. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you know Allie, who teaches Spanish at the high school. Uh, she's an amazing person to talk with. She is from Argentina originally, uh, has a very strong accent, but has, is extremely excited about what she does at the high school. Uh, if you remember two years ago, Sonia Medina came to me and asked about doing while she was in, I think it was either Spain or France, I think it was Spain, she was going to do a research trip over there and stay three extra days so she could do that and bring that back to her classroom. 
And Sonia did that and did a wonderful job with it. Well, Ali came to me the other day with the same idea. Ali is from Argentina. She's going home to Argentina for the first time, I think she said in seven years. And while she's down there, a major event has been for the Mapuches of Argentina, where their land, which is native, native uh, Argentine land, has suddenly been returned to them. It has before this been a very popular vacation spot. And so it has caused some uh, disruptions in Argentina. The final judicial plan was set aside on October 31st. So what she would like to do is to spend three extra days down there after the uh, seasonal holiday and therefore go up to uh, the Mapuche area and to do some filming and put some things together. She, she does already a uh, story on the plight of indigenous groups and what she would like to do is do this and have a much a lively presentation about that for them. I reviewed this with her the other day. Again, I, I do get such a kick out of her because she's just so excited about the possibilities. So I told her I would bring this to the board, that the board had approved such a plan before. What it would require is that Jeff have a substitute for three days after the uh, uh, holiday break so that uh, Allie can finish this job and then bring it back to the students. Uh, again, I told her that knowing the past history with this board, I was quite sure you'd approve it, but just wanted to bring it to you uh, for any discussion at this point in time. So this is just discussion. We'll yes. have to vote on it on the new business. Yeah, we'll have to move it to new business for a vote. Yep. Anyone have any questions on it at this point? Okay. Um, today, we received two, re, uh, one retirement and one moving away notice. And so I want to be sure to bring these to you this evening. According to policy, I can approve these, but I do not like to approve them without you knowing about them. So I'm going to pass, first of all, a person who is mo uh, moving, excuse me, <laughs> better take one myself. Okay. And the second one is for a retirement. The first letter is from a uh, Amy Matthew Silva. Amy is a Spanish teacher. Uh, what she's doing, she, uh, her husband is moving to Massachusetts to take a position there. And after much consideration, and I've had some uh, information from her before, she has decided that she truly needs to make this move with him. So she is uh, making her resignation effective as of January 4th, 2008. Uh, she talks uh, very clearly about the world language program and the efficiency-based bro program that we have. Uh, and as she has been well known as a very, very good teacher at the middle school and will be sorely missed. But she will, will be leaving as of January 4th. I did talk with Steve over email today. And uh, Steve has some plans as far as advertising and getting that position filled as quickly as possible, so there should not be any break in the actual program itself. The second one is a retirement. Uh, this is Mary Smaha. This is also a middle school uh, situation. Uh, Mary talks about it's been her pleasure to have served as a teacher of Cape Elizabeth Middle School for the past 20 plus years. Uh, she talks about that there is no finer school in which I could offer my time and education. Uh, at the end of the 0607 year, instead of, instead of during the ongoing school year, I entered the hospital for double knee replacement. Her intention was to return, however, her progress both physically and mentally and emotionally has been much slower than expected. So therefore, after much consideration, she has decided that she also would like to retire. And she says to please consider this a letter of intent to retire from teaching effective February 18th, 2008. Uh, I will, she will not be returning, and she thanks all of you for the wonderful years that she's had here. At this point in time, because she has not been here this year at all, we have had Carrie Newton in that position. Carrie has been covering it as a full-time substitute. And so what we will be looking at at this point is uh, continuing carry on for the rest of the school year since she's already there. If you remember correctly, she also worked at the middle school last year. At the end of the school year, the position will reopen. Kerry can apply for it, but we will reopen the position uh, and interview at that point in time. 
Any questions or thoughts with that? Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, and eight. One more. <laughs> you have one more. I have one more. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Mary is going to be retiring and will be leaving as of uh, December 31st. We have advertised her position. Uh, we have nine applications. Uh, I would like to do the interviews the week after Thanksgiving. Uh, what I would like to do is set it up so that we have several people on the interview committee. And the reason I would like to do that is, is that, as you know, although the whole issue of certification will no longer be done by the secretary in my office, uh, Mary will be the first to tell you the demands in the superintendent's office grow greater and greater every day. Uh, of the applications, of those nine, I happen to know four of them, and so I would prefer to play a role in it, but I do not want to be the main questioner. Knowing that the board depends on my secretary for a lot of information, as does Dominic, and as does, <laughs> and as does Sarah, what I would like to do is set up an interview committee to work with me to interview the candidates who we interview. My suggestion is that we have one or two board members on that committee. Uh, the, the purpose of the committee is to hear the interviews, to take the information in, and to make some recommendations to me for hiring. Uh, right now, I'm looking at that week of November 26th uh, to whatever that weekend's in, uh, to do these interviews. Uh, I will need to set it up. It'll probably be a day-long session where we'll do some in the morning and then break and ha then have some in the afternoon. Uh, so I brought it tonight uh, thinking it would be a perfect opportunity for any of you who might be interested in doing it to let me know so that I can be in contact with you ASAP and set the times and see if they will work for you so we can do this. I will tell you also, I asked Mary the other day and she has sent emails to each of these candidates to let them know that it's closed today. We got to review the, uh, their applications. Next week is not a good week to interview because of all the other interruptions. So I told them that we would start interviewing the week of the 26th. I intend to do at least a very full interview the first time. I may bring, if we have several candidates who we consider really top candidates, I may bring them in for a second round of interviews. I will have an essay process with it, and I will have a writing process with it to have them show some of their skills as far as writing is concerned. So I don't know how you want to deal with this. If, you, if there's anyone who would like to do it, I'll leave it to Kathy as far as how we make that decision, or if you want to let me know later. Well, does, any, does anybody here want to be on that committee? Uh, don't else be your ones. <laughs> I was going to say I would love to think about it and maybe ask you some questions sure. before I express okay. interest, yep. but I don't know how everybody else feels. Anybody else want to say yes or no? Or? I need to consult my calendar yeah. and make sure okay. I have the Great. availability. Okay, sure. okay so yep. what, I'll get back to you. So for the two of you, if you would like to meet with me and just talk about some of the possibilities, why don't we try to find some time uh, either this week or the first or next week and we can sit down and just talk about how we'll do it. I'm also, I will also be asking several staff members, uh, administrative staff members to serve on the committee as well. So there'll probably be six or seven of us on the committee. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to recognition. Um, I guess it's time to call for Keith to come up and tell us about the golf team and girls cross country and football. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll start by thanking uh, Alan and Jeff for being part of the greeting team here on Saturday. Uh, we had the principal uh, and uh, athletic director and superintendent from Mountain Valley along with Jeff and uh, Alan who greeted the people when they came in and handed out uh, rosters and so forth. Uh, it was all part of a plan to try to maybe improve some of the relations. When, and I think everything went very well. The people from Mountain Valley were extremely pleased with how everything went. This was before the game was played, by the way. <laughs> and uh, they even felt better afterwards. But it was, uh, it really turned out to be a, a great day for uh, high school uh, athletics, a great play in the field. Unfortunately, we were not victorious, but that's beside the point. Uh, everything went, uh, went really well. And, I want to thank the two of them for standing there in the cold and handing out uh, stuff to people as they came in. 
In addition to that, we had two of our fall athletic teams, the golf team and the girls cross country team, who were state champions. Both were undefeated in Maine competition. Uh, for the golf team, it's the second time in the, in the past three years that they've won it. Uh, two of the people were all state. Uh, Johnny Hayes was uh, named the outstanding high school golfer in the state of Maine this past year. So they had an outstanding year, as did the girls cross country team who finished eighth in New England's last Saturday uh, uh, in the New England competition, which is the best that any Maine girls team has done since uh, the Maine Principal Association continued play, uh, continued competing in New England competition. Uh, they again truly had an outstanding season. Uh, there we have uh, very few seniors in the crew. They're uh, back next year, so they should be do very well again. The boys cross country team are also with the Western Maine champions uh, as well. So we had a uh, we had a very successful uh, fall season, which ended for everybody uh, last Saturday. Any questions? Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, Trish, do you want to give us a brief update on the different parent associations and what they've been up to? Yeah, just a quick, the, we're so fortunate here in Cape Elizabeth to have such active um, parents' associations and they work sort of under the radar screen. We don't always thank them for what they do. But so this fall, a couple things I think are, were noteworthy and we want to thank them for all of their work. Um, the High School Parents Association brought Marty O'Connell, a guest speaker, to talk about the book Colleges That Change Lives and we want to thank them for funding their funding support of that as well as their efforts to get her here. Um, the Middle School Parents Association in conjunction with their book fair had the Newbury Award author Cynthia Lord um, who came and spoke. She did a great presentation. And the Pond Cove Parents Association, I believe, Tom, you might have to help me out with this, um, through their book fair donated a large number of books to the classroom. So we want to thank all of the parents in our community who always support our schools, but in particular we wanted to recognize those activities this fall. Thank you very much, Trish. Um, it's time for our school report, and it's time for Debbie Butterworth. Pardon me? Yes, she's, yeah. Yeah, she's on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, just as they're getting set up, uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, as many of you know, uh, because of a CIF, one year CIF grant, uh, Deb has become the math uh, teacher leader for grades K through 2 at Pond Cove. Uh, I have been over several times to visit her. She has an amazing classroom over there. And tonight she's going to share some of that information with you, as well as uh, this is the second edition of your newsletter? Edition second edition, newsletter. edition of her newsletter. Uh, Deb has spent a great deal of time organizing and planning this whole process. And so I think it will be an excellent opportunity for you to ha uh, see what she's doing and then possibly ask a few questions, although I guaranteed her we wouldn't ask a lot. Uh, thanks, Alan. I mean, just a, a quick word to the school board. Um, I think you're aware of the history of this um, new program. It was a SEEP grant that uh, that was the genesis for it. It was based partly on our reading of the future direction plan, the best needs of the school. But as I mentioned to the SEEP board this fall, it's one thing to have a job description, which is rather ambitious. It's another to have somebody uh, step in and, and take the job and do such a great, uh, great job with it. Um, it, it was a very ambitious job description. In addition to working with kids K through two, we wanted our math lead teacher, the MLT, to work with students, to help out with the curriculum, to be conversant with the everyday math material K through four, which is no mean feat in itself. Um, sometimes it's not just the person, but it's the timing. Uh, Debbie Butterworth competed for the job and uh, won the job and over the summer she participated not only in a statewide math leadership project but went to the wilds of New Jersey to, to uh, learn more about being a leader with the everyday math curriculum. Um, school started and you know the old flywheel comparison, as soon as school started Debbie set things in motion and they're going stronger every day. So. There's a flywheel, and then there's Debbie, too. So Debbie's got a program for you, and I'm going to assist later. Right. Thank you. Thanks. We 
have an exciting new classroom at Pond Cove to help students build a secure foundation in math. It's been fun and frequently challenging to define the program and select components that would be the most beneficial to both students and teachers. In this presentation, I'll take you to a visit to the math lab to see active and engaged students and share with you the, process, the successes that we've already observed. Not only have I learned a lot about math at Pond Cove, but my knowledge about technology has grown by leaps and bounds. This is actually the first PowerPoint presentation I've ever done, and it depended on a real teamwork effort with Kathy Oman, our computer teacher at Pond Cove, Jack Duffy of the technology staff, Tom Eismeyer, Alan Hawkins, and Gary Lenoy, all lending their expertise, so I really thank you for your help. Um, Ponco responded to the Educational Foundation's invitation last spring to apply for a large impact grant. Faculty discussions recognize a need to provide math support for our youngest students. We have outstanding literacy support, but have not had any resources to offer students and teachers in the area of math. So why did we decide to do this? To help with the developmental growth progress in math. Research shows that early intervention to fill in the gaps in foundational math skills and untangle uh, early misconceptions in mathematical thinking will result in students who have a better chance of successfully progressing sequentially through their classroom curriculum, which in our case is everyday math. And it stands to reason that students who understand the basic concepts and feel secure in their math abilities will view themselves as mathematicians and take more risks in the investigational problem-solving strategies that are the backbone of the Everyday Math Program. Designing this program was an exciting undertaking with the ongoing support of Alan, Tom, and Becky Swift. I was presented with two amazing opportunities last summer which coincidentally intertwined mathematical thinking and teacher leadership with the curriculum of everyday math. I was accepted into the Academy for Math Leadership, an initiative created by the Maine Math and Science Alliance. Over 70 math teacher leaders from across the state convened at Colby College for three days, and the information shared included every component of our new program. Through this ongoing initiative, I am part of a statewide network through which members respond to questions and reflections in areas of math that go far beyond lesson plans. This forum also gives me daily opportunities to correspond with other math teachers across the state about day-to-day -day math issues. An example was when someone posted an inquiry about giving students math support in addition to their classroom work. So I responded with a description of how our math lab works. I received more than a dozen inquiries asking for more information. We also attend four follow-ups meetings through the year, and at our most recent one, I was able to share ideas about the math lab with those people that I had been emailing with. My next opportunity came a few weeks later when I attended a three-day users conference for everyday math. There I had the opportunity to review the new 2007 edition and compare notes with not only everyday math teachers from across the U.S., but also with the authors and developers of the program. These two professional development opportunities allowed me to combine what I learned about mathematical thinking with specific curriculum topics and the ability to collaborate and correspond with colleagues from across the state. I also participate in an everyday math forum and look forward to a daily digest of curriculum issues that are discussed by teachers across the country. Through these forums, just as a side, I have donated and sent some old everyday math student reference books that we were discarding to a low-income school in Arkansas, and I'm now corresponding with the teacher in Michigan who is using our math lab model to create a similar form of math support in her district. With all this new information and reflections in my head, the logistics of the math lab started to take shape. The most important components to tackle first were assessment and identification of students with specific skill weakness and a good data record keeping system. All the second graders were given an end of the year first grade assessment which was aligned to the grade level standards established by everyday math and it assessed 20 skills that were expected to be secure at this point. As predicted, there were generally three to six students in each classroom who needed some reteaching in some of the baseline skills. Based on this data, which was all entered into a spreadsheet, small math groups were formed for specific targeted instruction. Skills were graded on a rubric from, from one to four with scores of three and four indicating solid understanding and scores of one to two indicating the need for reteaching of the concept. This is just one page of the, of the spreadsheet that I created, and these are with students that were in Lisa Derman's 
uh, second grade class. And so I can just go down the list and see students who received a score of a one or a two, and those are the students that I would pull out to do um, an, an extra lessons on. As pull-up math support was a new concept upon Cove, I wanted to portray the math lab as a positive experience for children. When students come for instruction, they're part of a math club and have a special pin to wear and keep, like the ones I've given you. And they feel like they're part of a group who loves to do math together. These groups are very short-term short and very fluid, depending on the skills being addressed, so the children have the opportunity to work with and interact with different students. Rather than subjecting little first graders to an assessment at the beginning of school, we felt we could get enough valid information from their kindergarten progress report. Similar results were noted in this grade level as well, with the identification of approximately 20% of the students needing a quick refresher in a few skills. The basic process for this targeted instruction is very structured. Lesson one is an everyday math lesson where the topic is introduced and practiced. Lesson two is generally an everyday math game or activity, and lesson three is another everyday math lesson where the topic is revisited, or supplemental materials such as these are used. This little girl was practicing some skip counting by fives. And these little girls are playing a memory game with uh, double digit numbers. These boys are playing an everyday math uh, clock and time recognition game. Um, we also have, we are able to use some computer technology. This is actually a, a, um, a CD of everyday math games that are similar to the hands-on games that the, that the kids play. Um, And here are a group of kids who did some more skip counting with chains. Um, based on student performance, if it appears that the students in the small group are secure with the concept, a curriculum-based measurement in the form of an exit slip is administered. This assessment is the same type of problem that was on the initial assessment to measure student progress. When students demonstrate understanding of the concept, they receive a fancy certificate Praising their hard work, the exit slip assessment is recorded, shared with the classroom teacher, and placed in the student's math portfolio. The group then disbands and other students are invited in to work on other skills. Additional data is also being collected as the students complete unit assessments in the classrooms. Teachers provide me with class profiles, which I transfer to student profiles, and that information is entered into the spreadsheets and in their portfolios, and new skill groups are formed. Okay, now if you could refer to the, this is to show you some of the results of bar graphs that I put in front of you. The red and blue comparative graph shows the baseline skills expected for incoming first graders. The red line shows how many students were secure with each skill in September, and the blue line demonstrates how many students following instruction in the math lab are secure in that skill now. For example, initially 119 out of 136 students couldn't count to 100, and now that number has increased to 135. We're working on writing numbers now, so I'll expect to see those figures change by the end of the week. The green and blue bar graph demonstrates baseline skills for incoming second graders in September, with the blue lines indicating skill mastery in September and the green lines showing the progress that the students have made. The value for telling time actually should be higher as six students completed their exit slip assessments this afternoon. And I'm pretty sure if they were here right now, they'd be able to tell you that there's something wrong with that clock. <laughs> Uh, a very useful portfolio has been developed for literacy and writing, but there was no system to collect students' math work for review and pass it on to future teachers. Now all students have a green folder like this in which classroom teachers file assessments, showcase work, and exit slips that will travel with the students through school. Many teachers commented that these portfolios were very helpful in discussing math progress with parents at conference time. 
a critical component to providing these students with the extra practice that they need in order to master skills is the generosity of volunteers who come in to work with them on previously taught concepts. I'm very, I'm very lucky to have your very own Karen Burke every Wednesday and on Thursdays Mary Jane Hamm, a parent who is working on her teaching degree and is using the math lab as part of her practicum. High school students also come up three mornings a week to work with different groups of kids. Skip counting by twos, fives, and tens is a particularly difficult concept to master. And we had 17 first graders who were struggling with this skill despite many manipulative math activities that I tried. I knew they needed more practice. So I adapted an everyday math game using a spinner that could be used during circle time in the classroom and made several for each first and second grade classes and showed the teachers how to play the game. Here are some first grade students in Karen Abbott's class who are playing this count and sit game, practicing counting by twos. Remarkably, within a short time, the students' abilities to skip count increased. Now the fives and tens are mastered, and most of the students have mastered counting by twos, as you can see by these first graders. Going back to the spinners, which have somehow become my trademark, in my quest to make these spinners for the math game, I searched the internet and found a graphing website that included pie charts. With a little experimenting, I figured out how to adapt these graphs for educational games that can be used for reinforcing a myriad of skills, including counting, probability, one-to-one -one correspondence, and their use has also been adapted by other teachers for the teaching of reading with sight words, phonetic blends, entered as values. I actually found the plastic arrows from a company in Nevada, and now I'm buying them in 500-piece lots. Knowing that you are frequently faced with difficult decisions around, <laughs> around funding and budget issues, I have made for you customized spinners to use during that process. You will quickly note that the probability of spinning yes when deciding on a budget issue for the schools is 4 to 2. <laughs> A large portion of, this, a portion of this position is to provide teacher support. I like to think that math support goes beyond the walls of the math lab. I've been able to learn new strategies and improve upon the ones that we already use and can positively Im impact small groups of students in the math lab. But when I can share that information with my colleagues, I can help them to positively impact whole grade levels. I recently held an after-school workshop for teachers to demonstrate how to make the now famous spinners and bingo cards that came from a website that was shared with me by Hayden Atwood a couple years ago. Materials were supplied and the collaboration of teachers resulted in a myriad of new ideas for using the spinners and the bingo cards. I frequently have teachers stop in with specific math needs and I enjoy the mission of finding the information that they're looking for. For example, a third grade teacher needed advice on how to reteach the concept of ballpark estimates. I was able to find the introductory and review lessons along with the worksheets in the grade two everyday math book and give her a packet of materials she could use to give her whole class a refresher lesson. The math lab has also become a resource to special ed staff as well. Ed techs, including one from the middle school, frequently stop in for materials for students who are working on specific skills. I also learned at the Everyday Math Conference the importance of students playing the everyday math games as a means to practice the skills in a motivating way. This was very difficult for teachers to fit into their busy academic schedules. We have an ed tech, Trina Richards, who rotates through classes to provide teachers with common planning time. Trina and I created an everyday, game, everyday math games kit, which she uses when in the classrooms, giving the students more opportunities to practice their math skills. And she is actually using this experience towards her certification credits. When I attend weekly team meetings for grades K to 2, I bring along a show and tell object to share. It frequently is an everyday math game I have made for their class, or some interesting piece of mathematical information I have learned, frequently from the electronic forums that I'm part of through MMSA and Everyday Math. I have also supplied the first grade team with an Everyday Math activities bin that can be used by their weekly parent volunteers to provide more practice for all of their students. 
And my enthusiasm for this math lab has been very difficult for me not to try to institute all the ideas I've thought of in the first month of school. But future plans would include a family math night, a math website, which is currently under construction, math camp in the summer of 2008, which would be in conjunction with a literacy camp, um, um, additional resources for accelerated students, plan to include all students for enrichment activities in the math lab, and a continuation of the monthly newsletter. So back to the original question, why did we decide to do this? We did it to give our students a solid foundation in math. To show them the joy that can come from learning. And to help them develop the confidence in their abilities, not only as mathematicians, but as lifelong learners. Are there any questions or comments? I, I actually do have a comment, and that is that if you can't tell from her presentation, that <laughs> Debbie's energy, enthusiasm, passion, and talent as a teacher is very contagious. And I've had the pleasure of working just a couple Wednesdays now with you. And um, it's very obvious the math lab is a fun place to go where kids can get support and reinforcement. So I think Pond Cove is very lucky to have you and what a great position for someone like Thank Debbie. You. So. Thank Good luck. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, yes, you will. <laughs> and we're very pleased that Karen has an outlet for her math energy. <laughs> <laughs> she needs it. <laughs> if I could just add a couple of words. I, I need to say to you that the work of people who are doing the type of work that Deb is doing is so important. We often look at having classroom teachers. We know that they are the key to the teaching process. But if you listen to Deb tonight and listen to all of the different ways she can affect learning, not only for students but for adults, it's amazing to go over there, if you haven't done it, stand outside the door and listen to some of the conversation that goes on. So that this type of leadership with Deb in math, with uh, Becky at, the, at Pond Cove, with the two leaders at the middle school, is an extremely important piece to the learning process that goes on. So when we talk about staff development, this is a really important piece to that. I can't tell you how pleased I am that after, in my third year here, we are seeing so many people providing the leadership, which is also helping people move ahead without getting stuck on something and saying, I don't have the time. They can turn to Deb and they can get the answers and move on. Uh, Deb's concern will be in the long run. How well does this all last? It always is for anything we do. And if you go over to Deb's room and see the documentation she has, I have no doubt that she will have every piece of information we need to have to do that. And I would also like to mention, I am thrilled that some of that material is going towards a portfolio. Because I think portfolios of learning are an extremely important piece uh, in the process of educating our students K through 12. And so I thank you, Deb, very much for all your hard work. Thank you. Can I just ask one quick question? The skills, I'm assuming um, that the skills you listed here, which was review in September, is it sort of a rolling thing so that as the teachers are introducing new concepts and they can sort of identify, God, that kid's having a tough time, then exactly. they would refer? Exactly, because at the end of every unit, there is a unit assessment. And so the teachers administer the unit assessment. And there are some skills on the assessment that are um, that are that are there needed to be secure skills at this point in, in the year and if a student and they so they record all of this on a on a class profile and then they give that to me and so if i notice that there are any students who you know get like a one or a two on that then that that forms a new group of of kids that, that come in and work on that and then there'll also be a mid-year assessment and an end of year assessment too which will probably create more more groups Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, thank Debbie. You. Thank you, Debbie. And I would say we will use this for budget decisions this year. <laughs> no, so no. much easier. Any decision you have to make, it really is. Well, it's well worth it. Just not with your kids. <laughs>
<laughs> too many yeses on there. <laughs> Good point. how you phrase the question. Well, true. Yeah. Yes, there we go. <laughs> and they are very adept at that. Uh, Alan, superintendent's report. Update on consolidation. What I'm going to do is swap that around. Uh, second part is the report from Hannah Jones. And so Hannah also has a computer to talk with. So I thought I would have her come up at this point. What Hannah is going to do tonight, as you know, for the last few years, she has been on a part-time leave of absence uh, to also begin to practice her writing abilities and the publishing abilities. Uh, there were a couple of letters, emails come to you today about Hannah. Uh, I have not planned and do not have on the agenda to discuss next year's plan yet. What Hannah is really going to do today is just to fill you in on what she's doing and how exciting it has been and what she's been doing with students at the high school as a result of that. The podium is yours. Do you have a spoon? So thank you for Life has been like for the last couple of years as a part-time teacher and a part-time writer. And to ask that um, as you're thinking about staffing for next year, you consider allowing me to be three-fifths on a permanent basis so that I can continue to do what I've been doing. Um, I was going to wear the official freelancer's uniform of my PJs tonight, but I thought you might be jealous, so <laughs> here I am. Anyway, in June of 2006, um, I went to Allen because I sort of um, felt a little desperate. I really wanted to write. I had applied for two sabbaticals two years in a row, and unfortunately there weren't any funds available. So I needed to find another path to be able to do the writing that I really wanted to do. Um, and Alan suggested that I take a part-time leave of absence, teach in the mornings, and write in the afternoons. And it's been the perfect solution for my problems. I've, or not problems, but it's been the perfect way to sort of achieve my dreams, really. I have been able to continue to practice the profession that I love, and I love it so much more now that I'm doing it just part-time. In fact, last June when school ended, I was disappointed. I didn't want to stop teaching. And after years of having taught full-time and struggled to write in the evenings, that was a really refreshing change. Um, at the same time, I'm happy to report that I've been able to keep body and soul together as a writer. And I've, uh, last year was really an exploratory year for me. I did some magazine writing. I wrote a collection of essays. I did a lot of educational publishing. And this year, I've sort of figured out what exactly I'd like to spend my time doing. So I've been doing educational publishing for bread and butter. And I've written a lot of books, um, chapter books for kids, test prep books. Um, I've written the comprehension skills and writing skills strands for a curriculum for sixth graders, and a lot of other things. And I'm also working on a novel, which is something that I've wanted to do for my whole life. So I've been able to sort of blend the sort of bread and butter writing that I need to do and the dream writing that I've always wanted to do. I think that my work as a part-time teacher or my move to part-time teaching has also been really beneficial for my colleagues and for my students for a number of reasons. First of all, as, as I mentioned earlier, I am refreshed. I am so excited about teaching every day. Um, I think it's also a huge benefit for my students to see a working writer in, in action, and I get to interact with students in a number of ways. I'm a classroom teacher. I teach two classes. I'm also in the Achievement Center one period a day where I get to work with aspiring writers on their craft, which is the coolest thing I've ever done. It's, I can't tell you how powerful it is to sit down for 20 minutes with a student and talk about writing. I can teach them things that two weeks of coursework wouldn't teach. Um, and at the same time, I've also been the uh, Bartleby advisor, that's our literary magazine, and I've been able to say to kids, you know, you don't have to be one of the anointed few to be a writer. I used to think that as a kid. I thought that only a few people ma managed to be writers. It's not true. There are lots and lots of people making their livings with their pens. So I've been able to share that with my students. Um, as Alan said, I've had a couple of friends send testimonials about um, the things that have been good about my moving to part-time. I also had um, a student, Tim Buckley, who won the Phoenix Award last year for having made the greatest gains in his sort of personal growth, write me a little testimonial too. And I'll just summarize it, I don't want to read it. But he basically said, 
that having me in the Achievement Center, having me available to have conversations with, had helped him to make the turnaround that he made in his life. I take no credit for Tim's incredible growth. I think it's all him. But I do think that having somebody who's not in the fray all the time involved in the life of the school has been a good thing. I've been able to serve on the CIF board as an educational advisor. I've been able to participate in extracurricular activities. I have a life, and part of that life is writing. And so I think the fact that I've been able to balance these two passions is something that I would really like to continue to do. And as you're making your decisions about staffing next year, I hope that you will continue to let me to do this. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? What magazines? <laughs> um, I had an essay in Down East. I wrote something for E, the environmental magazine. I wrote something for the Portland Phoenix. Um, so, you know, here and there, it's been fun. But I think I really decided that books are, are what I want to do for fun. So I'm writing one called Witchy Poo right now. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thank you. Hannah. Bye. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, now you want to move on to your yes. um, report on consolidation? Update on December 1st consolidation report to DOE. My hope was I would pass the rough draft to you tonight. Unfortunately, uh, I worked yesterday uh, until the electricity went out. I went home and worked on it some more. But we still have several pages that I need to finish up. So my intent is you will get the draft of the report before Friday so you get a chance to look at it. What I am going to give you, though, is just an overview of what is in it. And yes, it is much thicker than the commissioner expects. But it will uh, provide the commissioner with I, what I think is information, but also our legislators and I remember the State Board of Education need as they talk about Cape Elizabeth. So what you will find in this report that I have here is the first page of it will be a letter to the commissioner. And that is something that we will, I will be in contact with you about so we can put that report together so it reflects both the board's view and the uh, superintendent's view. And that will be the first page. It will go from there to uh, provide information about the reorganizational overview, uh, the mission, vision, and beliefs. The strategic plan will be here. The alternative plan, as it has been accepted by the commissioner. Uh, I've also put in here, which I think is an extremely important piece, the definition of essential programs and services. What is EPS, as they keep talking about that? Uh, what I have to do in here is to give a brief overview of the geography, demographics, and economics of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I have used uh, some of the materials that Jeff did for his NEASC report and have also gone to the new uh, comprehensive plan for the town and have taken some information out of that to uh, finalize this piece. We need to look at population. We look at a charting of the last 10 years and the next uh, three years. Uh, we look at the student census, and I will have some and I have some discussion ready for that. We'll also do the one-town concept. Uh, I think it's a very important because the one-town concept has been part of what the savings have been uh, uh, fiscally in this town for many years, and so I do have a very clear uh, definition of what the one-town concept is. Then I need to go to the EPS cuts that have been recommended by the uh, commissioner. The first one, uh, I should say, through the legislature. The first one is a central office, the 50% EPS reduction, which is finished in here. Uh, what was suggested to me is I'd give both an explanation, and there'll also be charts there, because for some people it's a lot easier to work with charts and information to manage that. The second piece is transportation, the 5% cut. That is one of the pieces we are finishing right now. Sue wrote for me the background for transportation, and we're doing the financial pieces of it. Facilities and maintenance, again, uh, we have the uh, explanation pretty well written. I just need to get it caught up, and the charts will be the next step. Uh, special education. At this point in time, from what I'm understanding from the commissioners of last Friday, the chances of a cut in special education are pretty slim right now. From what they have been able to see across the state, the numbers of special education have dropped. And they have dropped to an extent where the savings they had to make in special education would come out of the commissioner's office as opposed to our offices. I still don't have that final document with the signature on it. But that's what Dom and I are working on at this point. There will be information there to talk about the fact that CAPE is an 11 percent special ed population. The average across the state is 15 percent. And so we are below that average. And uh, our funding is below that average. And we are doing everything at this point within the system so that the kids stay here. 
Uh, there, we won't deny that there could be some day where we can't do that, but we're doing it at this point in time. I will also have a section on high school graduation statistics for the last six years. Uh, Jeff's uh, guidance counselors were able to give that to me so that I can show them how our students have done the year they leave high school, the percentages have gone on, the percentages who have gone on to school, the percentages who have gone into the military or gone on to work, or if we have any that didn't graduate. And then final, finally, I'll have a summation of what the information hopefully in, explains to the commissioner, to our legislators, to our state board members, et cetera. So it is uh, a longer report than most, most towns we're putting in. But I feel very strongly that we were seen as a unique community as a high-performing economic community. And so I need to be sure that clear, concise information is there. Connie has been extremely helpful. Remember, she was here as superintendent quite a few years ago. And so what she's been really helpful is to look at some of this stuff and say, I didn't know that. This is all new information to me. I'm so pleased to see the changes. So that is what I will be getting to you again, hopefully by Friday, either by contacting you or driving up in your dooryard on Friday to drop this off so you'll have all next week and the two days of the next week to take a look at it with any questions, et cetera, and then we can finalize uh, that report on the 27th to go from there. Thank you, Alan. Questions for Alan right now? I have a question. Sure. Um, it says EPS cuts, 50% EPS reduction. Mm -hmm. Um, what are we saying? Are, are, are we? <laughs> yes. So, so they're cutting the EPS funding. Does that therefore mean we are going to be cutting, we are required to cut our ending expense amount by that much? One of two things will happen, Rebecca, is that what, and I'll u use the central office one because that's yes, the biggest cut, that's 50%. Yes. So a couple of things will happen is that number one, we have gone through that budget for central office we've looked at it over the last three years. One of the things we've looked at is several of our employees in our office work part-time for the town and part-time for the school department, yet the school department pays the whole amount. So we've talked with Michael and we are taking an amount out of our budget, which is what would be used to pay uh, Pauline and Arlene, et cetera, to, to bring those down. The second piece that we have looked at is that is, is saying that you would be allowed under EPS next year $204 per student. Yeah. So we've looked at that piece to see how that translates into information now. Uh, as we have done all of that, we have dropped down so that we are $86,000 over EPS. That, and I think I said to you one time recently that uh, you can get rid of your superintendent and they'll take you down to zero and you'll be all set. You'll break the law, but that's okay. Uh, so that basically what it will be looking at for you is to say that we are able to take our budget down by the uh, $107,000 for the central office staff, taking part of the salary down from Mary's salary because we won't do certification in that office any, anymore. And therefore we are at this stage. I have not yet talked with the superintendent in Maine who has that central office at $204 per student. And so I think we're going to come as close as you're going to be able to do in order to make that happen. So long story short, we look at the EPS, what we're allowed, then we're taking the deductions that we need to do to have a very clear picture of what central office looks like. So that's, that's commendable work. So. Worst case scenario is we don't get it down to 204, but we present it as our budget and this, this town will vote to fund exactly. it. So we're not absolutely constrained to that EPS. No, amount. definitely not. And that has been, I think you've heard me say, that's been one of my biggest worries, is that the, the uh, state is looking at bringing budgets uh, eventually down to EPS. Uh, there's none of us who will survive with the right. EPS budget. So that's, that's what we'll have to okay. do. Thanks. Other questions? No? OK, great. Um, moving on to unfinished biz business. Uh, Trish, consideration of policies for second reading? The only policy we have for second reading is DFDR, which is gate receipts and admissions. 
Um, if you recall, last month's meeting, the extracurricular committee um, presented the changes. What you see in front of you is that change. The policy committee did look at this, and we accepted the recommendations of the extracurricular committee, and we'd like to present it, um, as you see here. You want to make a? I make a motion that we move the um, approval for gate receipts and admissions regulations. Um, DFDR as you see it. Is there a second? No second. Thank you, Karen. Discussion? Linda, I'm sorry. I have to ask this question because I didn't understand the answer the first time you gave it. Under um, number three, it says gate receipts for football and hockey shall go first to the school department to pay all expenses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why isn't basketball included in there? Why isn't basketball included in that? Yeah, so we talk about how um, somewhere we talk nope. about, yeah, yeah basketball. Emissions right. will be charged for turf field, hockey games, and basketball games. And then it says gate receipts for football and hockey shall go first to the school department. And it doesn't mention basketball. I'm just wondering why. Maybe actually. I think it's because basketball is I was going to say, but correct me if I'm wrong. Going to say that it's They're all, they, they all go in there. So we just need to add the word, the, just need to add basketball in here, or not, may, or not delineate two, two sports from the three. I think th in hockey, there are costs associated with the facility that we rent. So we've right. got to pay those costs first. For right. basketball, it's our own gym. What about football? And football is the lights on the field, and it's the other costs associated with the field, I believe, that are over and above the yeah, all, all, costs. All, all of the, uh, I think the important thing there, I don't have it right here in front of me, right. but all, all of the gate receipts goes into the student activities account. Is that what it's called there? Special, Special, Special revenue, revenue account. account. Special Charles revenue account. Yep. All the gate receipts go in there. But it does say any excess for football and hockey shall go first to the school department to pay all expenses and to the, for the event and second to the appropriate booster organization for the support of the particular athletic program. We, in, oh, thank you. Which is what will happen in, <laughs> what will happen in those two activities. I think it was the lights and the, hot, the rental fees for the hockey. And I believe we had a lot of discussion around this due to the fact that these have to be two sports that aren't highly funded by the school department. The booster organizations pick up a tremendous amount of the expense affiliated with these athletic programs. Yeah, I have no issue with that. I, I guess what I'm asking is... Where basketball is supported by, predominantly by the school and not the booster organizations. In other words, in, in number three, the second sentence, all gate receipts shall be deposited in a special revenue account for all sports. Then it's saying that in football and hockey, they will also go in there to pay the expenses associated with the event, and then they will go to the appropriate boost organization for support of the particular program in hockey and football. That doesn't happen for basketball. That just stays Correct. within. That stays, all of those receipts stay within the special revenue account. Correct. I understand. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Patricia? Okay. Um, all in favor? Seven zero. A uh, six zero. Sorry, I can't count. Um, excuse me. Uh, new business. Consideration of superintendent's recommendation to co-curricular fee positions. Okay. I have one sheet that is in your packet, and I have two sheets that I'm going to hand to you. So let me do the one in your packet first, and then I'll hand the other two sheets. The first one is uh, recommendations for core curricular fee positions for 0708. Middle school is Kim Roth, is an SST, a student study team member. Uh, she was left off the initial li listing, and so we want to get her on there tonight. At the high school, we have the math team. It's a one position. It's just shared as follows. Chris Haywood, 60%. Roger Rio, 20%. And Tony Giadoni, uh, 20%. And I have system-wide certification mentor, Sally Conley, who will be doing that for Carrie Newton. And I believe that's her second year doing it. So that's the first one. Uh, do you want to do all of the co-curricular at once? 
Yes. So the second sheet that I'm passing to you is uh, from Tom Eismeyer. That the additions to this are grade one team leader. Uh, Amy Kiernan has resigned as the grade one team leader. So he is uh, asking that Linda Sigmund become the new team leader on 927. Uh, also, you will remember that we have gone through middle school and high school student study teams. The study team we had not done was Pond Cove. Uh, I've talked a lot with Tom about it uh, because I wanted to be sure I understood why certain people were on this. Like, for instance, why there are three reading recovery teachers on it, why we have two math teachers on it, etc. I spent some time with Tom today in sorting this out. And I think that at this point in time, I feel strongly that this needs to be presented the way it is and that we will be assessing all three SSTs at the end of the year. So on his SST will be Angela Moore, Cindy Perkins, Deb Butterworth, Ellen Brady, Cameron Rosenblum, Karen Abbott, Linda Alfiero, Deborah Jordan Pearson, and Suzanne Hamilton. Next one. Just came late this afternoon. And this is from our uh, foreign language expert as the principal of the high school who sent on for our robot, a robotics advisor. Uh, I won't go into the foreign language. I'll just mention that he is nominating Eric Jensen as a robotics advisor at the high school. And he has also been in that position for two years. So those are the co-curricula uh, recommendations that I have for you this evening. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for co-curricular fee positions as um, presented. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Discussion? I do have a question. Yes. Um, during the budget process, will we then get a feel for what the stipends are, like yes. the amount of stipends and everything else, so we'll be able to cover that as a category? Okay. For instance, if, if you look at this Pond Co, uh, SST or any of the SSTs, it's, it's $1,050 per person for the funds that they get for that. Uh, I think the Linda Sigmund is the same, which is Tom right there. I think Linda Sigmund is the same amount, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, is it a little bit higher? Okay. Uh, so, so they are in that average range, but I can give you exact figures for each of those. They're all based on contract. Not meaning to sound like an old person, but um, I think one time a few years ago we talked about maybe having a form that was consistent so that when folks submitted this to you, you didn't get it in different formats. And one of the discussions was that the dollar value be placed there. Be placed there. I, for me, it's helpful because then I, you know, then it helps to dovetail into the budget process. And I know, you know, um, because stipends and so forth can, in, in onesies and twosdays can look small, but then when we get to the budget together. process and we're looking That's at correct. hundreds of thousands, then. So anyway, maybe that, I'm just, I'm not putting that out there as a, it's got to be done today or anything, but just thinking about yeah, that, definitely. maybe we could, some simple form that folks could use and then we get it in the same format. Does anybody have a problem with that idea or? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, any more questions? All in favor? Six zero. Thank you. We have the next one. And I now have coaching. Okay, so I want to be sure I have them all. The first one is from Scott Labby at the middle school. Uh, what you have is Tom Cohen, who is the boys expansion basketball for 120 hours in a level three. Leslie Young, a seventh grade girls basketball, 153.6 hours, level three. Returning coaches are Joe Doan for seventh grade boys basketball. Tony Jones for eighth grade boys basketball. Chris Drake for middle school swimming. Joe Doan for middle school indoor track. Charlie Carroll for middle school indoor track. Tracy Weatherby for middle school indoor track assistant. Uh, April Marie Doan for middle school indoor track assistant. And Megan Greenlaw for eighth grade girls basketball. On the second page, you have these new nominations, uh, just talking about, for instance, Tracy Weatherby, Middle School Nordic Ski, uh, and uh, returning coach is Carrie McCuska, who will be Middle School Nordic Ski. So those are the ones sent over by Scott Labby. 
Uh, I also have a sheet from Keith Weatherby. Returning winter coaches is Mike Botley, who will be the diving coach. And the new winter coaching recommendations is Hannah Doherty, JV girls basketball, level three. A former student of mine. Okay. <laughs> so that's what Yes. You didn't get that? No. Uh, no, the other one. This one? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Okay. And that's? That's all I have, Rose. Okay. Is there a motion? I move that we accept the superintendent's um, recommendation for winter athletic free positions. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Linda? Discussion, questions? Quick question. Yep. Um, expansion basketball, is that budgeted? It needs to look at it. How about same thing for the Nordic. middle? Yeah, the Nordic. School Nordic, yes. So that's a replacement of yeah, their new nominations because they're new people to those positions, but it's a replacement of somebody who's already there? Right. But one's a new nomination, so were there two coaches last year and one of them left? Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, there were, there were two positions. I thought there were two that were nominated. There are, but one is presented as a new nomination. So is that person well, new to the position at, which was vacated by someone else last year? It is. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying uh, my question. No, I understood what you <laughs> Other questions? Because I'm just curious, Joe Doan obviously is working very hard. Is he coaching two winter sports? Yes, he is. Okay. <laughs> the seasons are separate. Okay. They don't run concurrently. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Boys basketball is right now, right? And Boys basketball is right now. And that's Wow. Okay. Actually, that is a question, and Tom Cohan for Boys Expansion, is that 7th or 8th? And do we have expansion at both of those levels, or only on one level with the numbers of kids participating? We have an 8th grade team, a 7th grade team, and an expansion Oh, team. that's combined. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? 6-0. Great. Um, consideration of policies for first reading. Trish? Yes, the first policy we're presenting for first reading, and if this looks familiar, it is, um, is student travel and field trips. We have made some changes um, at probably Jeff's suggestion to make this more user friendly. The changes are highlighted in red. Primarily, they deal with high frequency trips. Um, so that the person doing the trip can get sort of one approval at the beginning rather than daily. Some of these are integral to classroom activities and to make, uh, and they're very close in proximity and so we sort of felt we were streamlining the process. So if you have any questions or comments, this is just a first reading so we don't need a vote. Have our attorneys seen this policy recently? Why, because it's so cumbersome? <laughs> We could certainly show it to them. <laughs> I, I'm just a little worried that we just keep adding more and more, and I, I, I wonder about the impact on liability as a result of that. Well, if something goes wrong, we're liable, no matter what the policy says, probably. <laughs> yeah. But that's probably a good suggestion. Probably we could certainly, a good suggestion. We could certainly run it by them. Yeah. Well, the last in adopted time was October 10th, 2006, which is just a year ago. Yes, I suspect. It was that they had reviewed this policy and part of it was their suggestion, maybe most of it, I just don't know. Um, it's probably longer. No, this yeah. policy is longer than okay. what they would have suggested. And, and as, as she said, a lot of it is, <laughs> as Jeff, and I think in particular, looked at his own school and some of the issues in his own school around field trips, is that's when we added the red. I think most of, most of the red you can, can give to our foreign language teacher and turn into a policy person here and added those things to it. I think the policy in and of itself is fine and I think this is very common. Actually, we, if we weren't still going through policies we haven't gone through in three years, 
it would be a good habit to get into to review the policies we adopt on an annual basis to say, is it working? Are there corrections we could make? Does it make sense anymore? So this, I think, because this one we've referred to so frequently, um, now probably, in the past year it seems, these are things that are sort of bubbling to the surface. This, this has to be one of our longest policies. It is. It is. Really long. I mean, Hannah probably writes things that are shorter it's, than this. It's a high, we want our kids, the bottom line is we want our kids to be safe. Right. But we also want our students and teachers to have, you know, experiences. What? Be able to find their way through it. Yes. Too, I mean. Well, it will take some time. But I think the bottom line is, and I think it, overall it does, it, it really seeks to, to protect our students and teachers. Um, <clears throat> the next one we're presenting for first reading is um, JEA, which is compulsory school attendance. This one is, this update is long overdue. We are suggesting, um, the, the presentation that you have in front of you is exactly what Drummond and Woodsum had recommended. And in this case, I, it is um, in compliance with current legislation. Can I ask a question, because I'm, I, I think maybe this question's been asked before, but I am confused. Um, when you have compulsory attendance ages that say seven, to 17, and then below, you indicate that somebody's reached 15, um, they can be accepted out of the compulsory attendance. I can't remember why, and I almost think Jeff told us, but I can't remember why there's a discrepancy there. Jeff, do you have that information? Uh, it has to be, it ha I believe it has to be appealed to the Commissioner of Education. So in general, my understanding is that kids need to be in school from seven to 17, However, under certain circumstances, um, and one of those being you have to at least be 15, then you can go through these hoops to see if you can be excused. Okay. They wouldn't even consider an exception under the age of 15. But if you've reached 15, then you can go through certain steps okay. to, ap to appeal to have the child out of the school. Wouldn't okay. there be under alternatives to attendance in public schools and you'd refer Yes, I mean, you, if they're not going to the public school, yes, that is. So basically it's a series of steps that you would have to go to, but you've got to be at least 15 years of age to at least attempt to be excused. Okay, and uh, my second question is, under excusable absences from school, uh, letter E, it says a planned absence for a personal educational purpose which has been approved. My question is, approved by whom? Good point. Probably, I would guess... The only thing that I would point out is that I think this, this, the language of this policy, all of it, is, is verbatim from state statute. It is. Right. And it's been an ambiguity in the law ever since it's been in existence. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I'm just wondering. Well, we're going to we allow it to, to stay that way, or do we then clarify it in some way so that somebody doesn't say to us, approved by who? I mean, because that was my first question when I read the sentence. I was like, and I understand that it's ambiguous in the state law, but then I'm thinking, well, but for our purposes, should it be ambiguous, or should we at least have the discussion about who that approval would come from? We can talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for my um, The next one is JICC, which is student conduct on school buses. This change um, is minor, but it is to so that we're in compliance with some of the um, administrative changes that have been made in transportation, transportation and um, designation of school bus stops so that children do not have to cross in front of a bus on busy roadways. Questions? And the administrative guidelines that accompany that, JICC-R, it's, it's carrying the terminology, the consistent terminology terminology through to the guideline. So we're really changing the word regular to assigned bus stop. Yes, because regular could mean where the child has regularly gotten off the bus as opposed to where your assigned. bus stop is now assigned so that you don't have to, it's primarily to address safety. Okay, thank you. And I believe that's it. Yeah. Great, and so anybody who has any additional questions? Comments, yep, we'll be just- Come to policy. Right. Or okay. email me if you can't make it to the meeting. 
Um, 11D, consideration of proposed negotiated agreement with food service workers. Anybody want to make a motion? I move that we approve the um, contract, which has been, you're going to have to help me with the language, which has been presented this evening. In executive session. In executive session. Is there a second? Thank you, Linda. Um, discussion? All in favor? 6 0. Okay. Committee reports? Um, did we have two more? Did I miss some? No, the we were, foods. Oh, no, uh, no, Allie Gwither. Allie Gwither. The uh, extension of her. The teacher extension. Oh. The three day extension for the teacher. Yes, thank you. Alan, um, the Argentina. Right. Yes, do you want to, um, oh no, you've already covered it. So I think it's just a motion. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion, Linda, since you seem to be so good at reminding us? Do you want to make a motion? Okay, well, I don't, I don't know the woman's last name. I got the alley. White. Alley. <laughs> White. I move that we approve the extension of the teacher's holiday for three days in Argentina. Is that all right, Alan? Boarding. Thank you. Is there a second? Krish? Any discussion? All in favor? 6 0, thank you. Um, and I guess. Sorry, I uh, Krish did. Yeah. And I guess the, I also have the question does anybody um, want to make a motion about the letter MS from M MSSA, MSSA that was in your packet that you received on Friday, Saturday? What we'd like to do with it? Yes, if, if, if somebody wants to make a motion and then somebody wants to second it, then we can discuss it. Okay. I, okay, I'm, I will move for the purpose of discussion that the Cape Elizabeth School Board lend its support to the letter um, no. requesting amendment of the consolidation law that was presented by the Maine School Superintendents Association. Is that it? That's the one. It's a resolution, though. I think it's different. Well, we've got three. No. Uh, my motion is for the letter to amend. The other two are repealing, and that's not what my motion is. My motion is to lend our support for the letter, which is requesting amendment to the legislation, primarily for an extension of time. Thank you, Trish. And Oh, go Sorry, go ahead. No, I think I'm done. Okay. Is there a second? A second. Linda? Discussion? How are we going to lend our support? Um, I, Alan, I think, you want to help? I think, <laughs> I think basically what they're looking for is if this school board supports it, then I will let them know. And so you will be a part of the plan to support this as it goes, as the discussion continues. Okay. So you'd send them a letter yes. saying Cape Elizabeth School Board is okay. Other questions? Just clarification now. That yes. is not no. these. No, those are separate. Those are just so you have okay. proof that there also is a move to try to set aside the legislation altogether. So this page two and three are information right. only. Right, yes. I guess one. my comment is by going ahead and supporting this letter, then are we as a board saying we are not interested in supporting a repeal of consolidation? I'm going to, I, I, I can't give you a direct answer. I'm going to give you, I think, answer. I think the first page is really what the main School Board Association and the main Superintendents Association wants to really slow the process down. I don't think the Superintendents Association, nor the Maine School Board Association, is really working towards uh, ending that legislation. Uh, I think we will, if it does, carry. Again, I don't know how many signatures they got and whether it will go before the legislature or not. I think when that comes, we may be requested to look at that as well when it comes along. Other questions? Concerns? Rebecca, you look like you were going to ask a question. Yeah, it's okay. No? Okay. Uh, Just yep. on Karen's, and piggybacking yes. on that, cor correct me if I'm wrong, if we sign this, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. No, 
Definitely not. And we could certainly, I mean, if the response is no way, no how, then we're in a different place. Definitely. And we can say, okay, you know, the ante's been up a little bit. We really feel strongly that it's not the right thing. No. So Definitely. I think, pursue that. I think uh, I'm serving on the State Legislative Committee for the superintendents, and you're also, uh, uh, Rebecca, getting, will be getting, as the session starts, a lot of information. Uh, if that goes into the legislature, I think then uh, if there is a motion to carry this through, there'll be a lot of discussion about who will support it, how will they support it, what does it mean. Again, right now, of, the, of these members of the Executive Committee, what I heard very clearly, except from Bob Webster from Sargentville, who had the uh, petition to end it. Most of them were saying, we don't disagree with the plan. We just disagree with the speed of it. So this really looks at that. But if this becomes you know, a greater issue, a bigger issue in the legislature, then it will probably return to us through me. It will come back to you and probably Re Rebecca as well uh, to take a look at it at that point. Uh, I should mention to you while you're asking that question, though, you may have seen in the paper where the uh, legislative committee who looks at all the bills had reviewed them the other day, and they did not make a decision on what they're going to accept and what they're not. What they are doing is there's a committee looking at all the bills and trying to marry them together so there aren't as many and trying to decide what will be set aside. My understanding is that those of us on the legislative committee for Maine School Management We'll probably have some documents in mid-December to bring back as the first round of what these will look like. Great. Trish, uh, I'm going to disagree with you. I think that if we as a board support this letter requesting amendment, it then is, I, I don't see then how we can turn around and then say to the legislature, we want you to repeal the legislation. I think it's sending two different messages. Um, so for myself personally, I need to think about Cape Elizabeth and whether this law serves education in Cape Elizabeth or not. Um, and, you know, fine, we got an exemption we still don't have on paper that it's for three years, do we? No, we don't. So for all intents and purposes, it's only for one year. Um, so while the superintendents say they, they just have an issue with the timing of it, I think we as a board need to take a careful look at the law and say, is it just, do we have just an issue with the timing of it, or do we have an issue with the law? Well, except that if you read through there, they're also saying to allow each RSU to adopt its own cost sharing agreement to authorize each body to determine the method by which its budget is finally approved. So these six points seem to address at least the majority of the concerns. I mean, I, I hear what but you're it's, saying. It's still a regional school unit. It so, is. So, you know, sure, when we are consolidated with another district and we're a minority position, we will have all the opportunity to decide how we want our budget decided. But it's still saying that we have to regionalize. I mean, we still have to consolidate under the law. Mm -hmm. What is the downside to us not supporting this? Is your question to Alan? Well, I, I think Rebecca's making a good point. As, as she's talking about it, I'm thinking about it myself, is that I think the original plan was that this is an initial message to go to the Department of Education that a majority of school boards across the state, if they do this, support this issue. But I think the question that Rebecca is asking is a, is a good question is, what does happen if it does come to the point where there is a major move to repeal the law? Uh, my sense is, is this is an initial statement. This is not law. This is what an initial statement about what we see, we think should happen. This is actually a special resolution which will go before the legislature if it, if it gets enough uh, votes. So I think, I think Rebecca's question is a good question. I think what I might suggest is, is that if we look at what you have just talked about, both from this letter and also from the feedback that Rebecca has given, perhaps what I need to do is talk with them tomorrow and talk to them about the, about the question of the discussion here at the board is that if we do this, 
And if this happens and we want to support this, like Rebecca is saying, because of some of the issues, can we move away from this and move on to this? Uh, this again is not legislation, this is legislation. So I think that's the big difference in the two. But I would be more than happy to talk to them because you've, you've opened a question for me that I really need to look at very quickly. This was, this was something that was presented to us in the last 10 minutes of our meeting in Augusta uh, we could go Friday. So I'd be happy to go back and ask that question and you could take the vote on the 27th if you feel you want to vote. I can get you more information yeah, at that I point can, in time. I can just add one more sure. thing. I feel like reading the details of this versus the repeals that our discussions as a board are much more in line with the details um, outlining support for repealing than they are in sort of implicit support with reservations of consolidation. So I would hesitate um, to go ahead and support this letter. And I think that's the point you were trying to make too, wasn't it, Rebecca, yeah. that we need to look at that. So let me do the questioning and get some information and then we can look at it again on the 27th. Trish, do you want to withdraw your motion? Um, yes, I'll withdraw my motion. <clears throat> okay. I think it would also be helpful. Can I talk? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was sort of looking at it through a political sure. reality lens. If we've heard from you that Commissioner Genrin said no to school districts who are struggling to get to, to, get to yes. 1,200 is no the answer, and are then are we trying to do the best we can with the reality that we're working in? So, and I think if uh, one of the members of this is Scott pa uh, Porter, who you see is in Machias, and he's one of them that is is at this stage. I think you have five districts coming together, and they still have only 1,050 kids, and there's no other district to go out and find to do that unless they move further down the coast and you know travel 40 miles a day. So, so certainly with, with Scott and with Bob Webster, they are very much in favor of getting rid of the bill altogether. Yeah. But I now, you know, now what I heard Rebecca say and you say, I think we do need to, I need to ask that next question that goes along with that. Okay. Um, committee reports, if we could be brief. Rebecca, Finance Committee. Brief. Okay. Um, we met on October 19th. Present was myself, Pauline, Kathy, and Sue King. Um, Alan, were you there? Yes. I'm so sorry I didn't put your name on there. Uh, just so you just know I'm there. Sorry. You don't think about it. Uh, we reviewed the food service program. Um, we had a significant negative balance of $10,000. Uh, Sue noted that the high school is down 200 to $300 per day. Um, and our negative student accounts are currently around 3000 which was down from 4600 last year at this time. The energy report was reviewed, and there is concern with potential high energy costs this year. Ernie was unable to get a reasonable fixed price, but did get an agreement for $0.06 cents over rack price. Gasoline was budgeted at 220 and is currently at 247. Uh, in addition, our kilowatt hours were budgeted at. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm not going to go into that. The notes will be on the website if anybody really wants to get into this. Um, but we have had a, a total savings in electrical usage of 1600 due to um, continued improvement of energy management through Ernie's wonderful computer program. Pauline reported that an inventory list of needed classroom furniture has been completed for the high school and middle school. Um, the elementary school information is forthcoming, and this will be utilized for the bond that will be um, floated this, uh, in the spring. In the spring, I think it's May. Per the it's agreement with the town council for this budget year. Um, prices on a new emergency system are being gathered, compared, and reviewed with the assistance of the emergency response team. That is also in conjunction with the bond that's going to be floated. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, November 28th at 8 o'clock in the superintendent's office. Thank you, Rebecca. Policy Committee, Trish? Uh, most of the policy discussion has been presented. I guess the only items that we did not discuss or that were not presented tonight, um, IK, Policy IKD, which was a 10-point versus a 7-point grading discussion that's been ongoing, we um, took into consideration the feedback from the high school and middle school students, which actually was kind of contradictory, interestingly enough. Um, and we decided to leave well enough alone at the seven-point grading scale for now. Um, let's see. 
We spent quite a bit of time talking about um, the attendance and truancy policy. The truancy policy I hope we'll see um, next month. It has a lot of the same issues as the attendance. We really need to update it, but there's a lot of legislation going on or pr proposed legislation related to truancy, um, so we did not present that tonight, but we will continue that discussion. And our next meeting is this Thursday at noontime. And I would encourage people, our, just for the benefit of the public, we are constantly reviewing policies. They are online as um, they are updated. So I would refer people to those. Thank you, Trish. Communications, Trish? Um, we met last week. Um, and we have a couple things. The, we talked a, a little bit about having some type of senior appreciation dinner or luncheon for some of the senior members of our community as sort of a way to reach out. We decided that the dinner was a little bit too much of an undertaking and we have no money to do that in the budget. <laughs> So we'll work on that for next year. But we are going to, thanks to Sue Weatherby and Community Services, going to um, put together a small or abbreviated school program and help out with a breakfast on Thursday, January 17th at 8.30. So I would encourage any school board members who are available, I'll be sending out more details on that, to attend. Um, and we've been working on the next issue of The View. Um, and we talked a little bit about um, just other ways to connect the schools. One of the suggestions was to have school board members attend one or two of the faculty meetings during the year. So we're trying to reach out and, and um, improve communications. And we're well, anyone who has suggestions or um, how better to improve that should contact either Karen or myself who are on the committee. Thank you, Trish. Personnel, Linda? Uh, personnel has not met since our last meeting, but our next scheduled meeting is this Thursday morning at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Strategic Planning Committee, Trish? Um, we met in October. We primarily were focusing on creation of the action teams for the strategic plan. Um, and that's where we are. Our next meeting is December 10th. Thank you. Student Extracurricular Committee, Linda? Actually, I'm going to turn this one over to Peter. I was absent for the last meeting. Okay. Thank you, Peter. You didn't know <laughs> <laughs> Just briefly. Actually, really meeting met uh, two major topics of discussion, one being Hannaford Field, uh, and I'll discuss some of that now. I won't have to give a report on Hannaford Field later on. It was basically a general discussion, as we've discussed many times at school board meeting. The operation of Hannaford Field through the first season is one of a learning experience for all of us. We continue to learn. Uh, the last three games of the season were extremely well attended. Keith reported that I think the York game, we had in excess of $2,500 in gate receipts. And the first Mountain Valley game, we had in excess of 5,000. I'm sure that was true of the second game as well. We've learned a great deal about collection of gate receipts. The problems have become smaller and smaller with every game. Everything is being deposited. I'm sure Pauline and Keith in the near future will be distributing a report to us as to what the actual field expenses are and the gate receipts and how they've been distributed. We'll also have some final light bills and things like that. that the field, along with the rest of us, goes into its winter doldrums for a while and will be resurrected come spring sports. So we'll have an amount of time to discuss ongoing problems with the field and things we wish to change. Bleaches, bathrooms, concession stands at our next meeting will be number one on the agenda and how they're going to be funded. And I'll report back to you at that time. Our next meeting is on December 6th. Continuing on extracurricular, after speaking a few minutes on the Hannaford Field, we also spoke to a group that came proposing to us the Special Olympics proposal. And uh, we agreed to support the concept of funding the stipend for the coaches for our Special Olympic team and dividing it amongst three staff members. And the boosters are going to be funding the rest of the expenses by fundraising. Uh, that will be brought before the board at a later point in time but it was discussed openly with the extracurricular committee and also our superintendent, and there is a great deal of support for it. I have nothing further, Kathy. Thank you, Peter. Uh, wellness committee, Rebecca. The wellness committee met on November 5th uh, at the fire station. There were several new people there that we are very pleased to have on board, Mary Smith, Beth uh -oh. Milroy, and Jean LaValle. Um, Mary Ann Lynch gave uh, the committee an update on the Shore Road Pathway Study. Um, the council is currently accepting applications for citizens and um, the Wellness Committee is very supportive of this idea as you, we will talk about later. There's a walk ride to school and 
if we want to encourage our children to engage in more physical activity, we probably need to make sure they can do so safely. And that's where the Shore Road Pathway Study comes to play. Uh, Paula Harris gave a brief um, overview of the PAC week, which was um, an effort over a period of week to have kids bring in um, vegetables. Uh, there was a survey taken, and overall it was well received by the teachers. Um, there was a discussion about the need to work on the timing, perhaps not so early in the year, and a little bit better coordination. Sue Weatherby reported on the walk ride to school, which is tomorrow morning. And uh, it looks like the weather is good. And I'm hoping you have the volunteers that you need. Okay. <laughs> and I encourage everybody to keep your eyes out for our children who will be hopefully walking and um, riding their bikes to schools. Um, Karen and I gave an update on Let's Go. And um, everybody recon recommitted to um, the program Let's Go. And um, we're looking forward to moving we're looking forward to moving forward. That doesn't sound very good. Anyway, um, we did note that middle school and Pond Cove are underrepresented on this committee, and we would encourage you to um, maybe uh, talk to some of your teachers about coming, coming to these meetings. Um, we will be beginning to establish some lunch program visits. There are a number of people on the committee who are interested in doing that. And we're also been, are talking about a wellness calendar um, possibly being on the town website. Our next meeting is December 3rd at 315 in the fire station meeting hall. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, PATH's um, report is PATH has started working on their budget for next year. And um, we're getting presentations for each meeting that we go to. And there's another one later this week. Thursday. Thursday, thank you. Um, Legislative liaison, do you have anything, Rebecca? Nothing. Okay. Advisory, um, Seif. Karen? Uh, yes, I've had some constructive discussions with Matt Bates and Dory Barber of Seif regarding how we can improve the relationship between Seif and the school board. Um, one idea that was proposed by Seif was um, once a new board is in place, Seif would like to attend a board workshop and discuss um, the following, who they are and what their mission and goals are, how Seif feels we can work better as partners, um, they'd like to hear from us where we're coming from, our challenges and concerns regarding CEIF, and how the school board thinks um, we could also work better with them. Uh, other ideas we can generate on our own, and other ideas are being generated by CEIF. And of course, the objective to be to strengthen the understanding and goodwill between us, and ultimately become effective partners in improving education in CAPE. Kathy may I make one more further comment about Hannaford Field? Yes. Uh, we do owe a thanks to Sue Weatherby and our custodial staff. After our first Mountain Valley game, the boosters collected all the garbage and stacked it by the fence. And on Monday morning, it was scattered throughout the field with the help of various animals and seagulls and everybody else. Uh, this time around, Sue took the recommendation of the extracurricular committee and parked the town's trash truck, the pickup truck, by the entrance to Hannaford Field. The boosters once again collected all the trash, but they loaded it into the truck. Custodians took it to the dump, and they also helped clean up the exterior of the field beyond the fence. And this was done without additional cost because the custodians were already on site due to the school play on Saturday and Sunday. So, wow. with a special thanks to community services and the custodial staff, on Monday morning when the public works crew showed up, there was nothing for them to do. The field was spotless. Wow, that's terrific. Thank you, Peter. Um, Public comment. Is there anyone here to make public comment on items that are on the agenda? Nope. Seeing none. Um, school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for Alan? No. Um, I'm not going to announce the upcoming meetings because I think we've already covered them. Um, and prior to adjourning for this evening, um, we will be going into an executive session again. Um, so, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to go into executive session. Don't we? Oh, okay. Then I'll, I will make the motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss the superintendent evaluation has provided by MRSA 4056D. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Thank you.